Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, paleoclimatology means uh, looking at uh, climates in the past. I'm a geologist by training, and I've actually worked in Antarctica many times looking at fossil plants and trying to reconstruct ancient climates. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today, because when I heard that George was going to talk about the new tractor train to the South Pole, I thought I would uh, talk about a specific project that the British Antarctic Survey are undertaking to uh, look at a very large glacier in Antarctica and how that's um, impacting on or how climate change is affecting it. And we're using the, uh, many of the uh, uh, developments that, that NSF have used. There's been a lot of work together to develop this new way of transporting people and fuel across the continent. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the science and the people that are doing this project. So this is a project that's run by the British Antarctic Survey. It's called ISTAR. It's a multi-million pound project that's sort of in year one or has had one field season of two and then there'll be some follow-up years of, of analysing the science and it's funded by the Natural Environment Research Council and you can see there, uh, you recognise those from George's slides, it's all about how science is being done in a different way in Antarctica by the British. So one of the things, now you're in New Zealand, you're close to Antarctica, and I know that Antarctica is a, is a really important feature of New Zealand life, and it's on the news a lot, and it's in the newspapers, and it's close by, relatively. And people always ask, what on earth is the U why is the UK interested in working in Antarctica? It's the other side of the world. And it, it's something like, like this. So one of the things that Antarctica, why, why Antarctica is important to the UK is that Antarctica has about 70, over 70% 70 of the world's fresh water trapped in that ice. And it's, Antarctica is changing, and the ice is beginning to melt. And what's happening is it's affecting global sea levels. So you don't have to live in Antarctica or New Zealand to feel this. We can feel this in um, the UK even, or any low-lying nation, any, any area around the world which has a, a, a shallow coastline, which, as you know, most of the population lives in. And in UK particular, you may have seen last uh, winter, we had terrible storms uh, in the UK, particularly in the southwest and in the east. And the London barrage uh, had to be closed several times. And we're having big storms in the UK. The sea level is beginning to rise very, very slightly. But in future, if it, it, it uh, rises more, we're going to have trouble, particularly in a large area like London, so with all its political and economic uh, um, links. So there is a huge concern in the UK for flooding. So we have to go all the way to Antarctica to do this research. And ISTAR project in particular is looking at the impact of climate change on this big glacier and the impact it will have on global sea levels. And this project has been going now a couple of years. So here's where uh, Pine Island Glacier is. It's in the, the British mostly work in this sector. So although there is a lot of international collaboration, as Peter and George have said, and we have scientists that work all over Antarctica, in particular, the area of operation of the British is here. And this is sort of at the extremes of where Bass, British Antarctic Survey Bass can operate. And most of the time, the operations in Bass oops, are done by, uh, let's go back one, by Twin Otter. So we have about uh, five, five aircraft and they carry fuel and people into the interior of Antarctica. But we began, and we have two ships as well that do a lot of oceanic work. But now we're beginning to move in a slightly more efficient way and more cost-effective way, because it costs an awful lot of money to do science in Antarctica, and try and do things a bit more efficiently. So this is um, a satellite map of Antarctica, a compilation of many images that measures the elevation change of the ice in Antarctica, so the thickness changes of the ice. And you can see here that the red areas are the ones that are beginning to thin. So this area here, which is the Pine Island Glacier, sticks out like a sore thumb. There's a lot of other large glaciers here you can see are melting. And all along the peninsula there are glaciers that are thinning, and there's an area over here called Aurora Basin. A lot of glaciologists, people who work on ice and glaciers, are working on to try and understand how the climate is affecting these glaciers. So um, the British have been working here now in, for the last few years and will be, I think, into the future because this really is a, quite an important area. Here it is again. And you can see this is the Pile Island Glacier here. It's a huge glacier. Uh, the, the blue bit here is the, the ice shelf. 
and then the, the red bit are the glaciers that drain into it. You can see there are other big glaciers here as well. And this is draining a huge amount of ice over particularly this area here. So this area here is called the West Antarctic um, ice, ice sheet. And it's, it's slightly different from this bit over here over the continent. The East Antarctic ice sheet sits on a, a continent of ice. It's a big block of ice up to about four kilometers thick sitting on a continent. And it's a little, little bit more stable, it's a lot more stable than the West Antarctic ice sheet. But this one here is actually a big ice sheet that's pinned in a few rocky places. And actually most of it is actually, uh, if you like, floating on the ocean, except it's heavy, so it's below sea level. And this then is, makes it more susceptible to change. And what's happening at the moment is that the ocean is warming, so the ocean around here is warming, and it's flowing underneath this ice shelf and melting it from below. So it, there, there is quite a lot of change going on in this glacier. And at the moment, the Pine Island Glacier, it's a big one. It's uh, melting slowly, so it's about three millimetres per decade of melt r affecting global sea level, which doesn't seem very much, but added up, it's quite a lot and will have a big impact. And uh, losing a lot of ice, so it's losing the equivalent of a big block of ice, 100 metres deep, 500 square miles wide every year. That's, that's a lot. So this big project in, uh, in, from the UK, from British Antarctic Survey, it actually consists of four parts, so there's four teams. And I'm just going to talk about one team that's going over land, over the glaciers, but there's another team on a ship that's working on the ocean, another team that's looking at what's happening underneath the ice sheet with sort of submarines, if you like, to go underneath the ice sheet. There's another group working down here on the end of the ice shelf. And then there's a group here, the Ice Star group, which are working on this glacier. And you can see here the track that they took last season. So they covered over 900 kilometers across the Antarctic ice sheet. And this would have been impossible to do just by a plane. We'd have to put in so many depots, it would have been well, almost impossible and uh, extremely expensive. So 12 people spent several months last Christmas looking at all the different features of this ice sheet, trying to understand what's happening to it. And here they are. I thought I'd show you some scientists. Uh, this is a Christmas Day last, well, this year, Christmas Day this year. And you can see, uh, because it's the Pine Island Glacier, it's called it's the pig, so there's their uh, snow pig. You can see some, yeah, that's a, there you are, there's a the pig there. <laughs> it's not a snowman. There's also, I noticed there's a head there of a pig as well, where I don't know where that came from. Uh, so this was the team that worked there, and they did this massive trans, tra traverse across the ice. So what happened was, instead of a plane taking fuel down, there would have been, in the old days, there would have been many, many, many journeys in a, in a twin otter carrying barrels of fuel. Bar a barrel of fuel is extortionally expensive, especially if you had to transfer it from, say, the UK or wherever you get your fuel, and then you have to transfer it in a plane miles and miles, hundreds of miles in Antarctica, using up a huge amount of fuel to take one barrel in. So instead, everything was put on the ship, the Ernest Shackleton, and it was taken down here, and you can see the ship is parked right against the edge of the, uh, the snout of the glacier, and all the uh, scientists joined the ship and then unloaded all the gear onto the ice, sh onto the ice shelf. So here you can see, here's the ship here, the, the yellow funnel there, and they're uh, starting to unload with these big cranes, so here's one of the big uh, snowcat type vehicles with a snowplow called a piston bully, which is commonly used by many, many of the international programs, trying to, uh, unloading, there's the big sledges, and then I'll show you, that's the living quarters. So this was unloaded from the ship, and here, as George has shown you, here are these big fuel bladders. And the really difference is that a, a fuel in a barrel costs a huge amount, but fuel that's not in a barrel in the bladder costs far, far less. And this is a far more efficient way of, of moving the fuel. It, it, it really has radicalised, certainly our budget, and also the way that we can move across the continent. So here they are. You can see them putting on these, these uh, as George mentioned, these rubber mats and the fuel here. So for this expedition, they used two of these sledge, eight bladders of fuel uh, for this expedition. And here we are underway. 
So you can see that it's what looks like a very tiny little snow cat here with a snow plough in front, but they're very powerful little beasts carrying. This is the living quarters of the scientists on here with lots of supplies on top. And here are all, uh, some of these boxes contain food for all the scientists, a lot of scientific equipment, and then the fuel bladders towed between. So there were two of these tractor trains used for this project. And here we go. Here's the sort of the, the meat at, the, big, at the, the start of the tractor train, if you like. Very powerful machines. And these are, the, these are the living quarters, so everything they needed were in this small caboose, this small cabin. It's, it's quite interesting here. You can see the temperatures most of the time here are quite low, so usually about average about minus 10. But on a nice sunny day when the wind isn't blowing, you can see here uh, most of the scientists are just living in their thermal underwear and they're quite happy walking around like that. And inside this, uh, the living quarters, you can see it looks very much like a small, uh, small cabin. So they've got almost a proper kitchen, um, proper seating area. They were working almost 24 hours a day. There was 24 hours of sunlight. So everything was going all of the time. There were no sort of stopping periods and even catching up on sleep, I can see here. And this is heated, so uh, quite a, a, a nice place to be during the day. And this is where they actually live. There's not enough room in that cabin to actually sleep. So on a, this is a bad day on the Pile Island Glacier. Everybody had their own tent. You can see they were pegged out, ready for storms um, near the, near the uh, place where they were working. So they moved around an awful lot. So they traveled hundreds of kilometers, but they also set up a camp every, every uh, couple of days and then they, moved, then they dismantled the camp and move on. And tents were fine like that. It takes a very short amount of time to dismantle a tent, pack it back upon the top of the caboose and then move on. And here's what a camp looks like from the air. So here's a bloke here with his uh, kite and he's put a camera onto the kite so you could take a picture back at the, at the camp. So there's the, there's the sort of living quarters. Uh, these are all parked out very nicely. The British are very tidy in the way they do things. <laughs> but you can see. <laughs> but there's, there's reason in it in that if you get a big storm and the snow starts blowing, it makes huge drifts. Anything on the surface creates a drift. And so you have to make sure that things are spaced apart. Otherwise, you end up with this huge pile of snow over the whole camp. And you, What's the color-coding of the tents? Is there a reason for that? <laughs> no, I don't, th I don't think there is, no. But you can see that they've actually put a small wall of snow around each one because the prevailing wind is coming in this direction. And so this is to stop any uh, major, if there's a major storm, it will stop the, the snow will blow round it and not over it and bury the tent. But this is a good day in Antarctica, a fantastic place to work then. Although I like working on rocks and they just work on snow and there's nothing to see. And then the bladders are quite useful because because they're nice and because they're black, they absorb the heat from the sun and they get very warm. And so every now and again, they stop to sort of warm up. And it's also extremely comfortable lying on these, apparently, uh, to have a rest in the sun. Now, some of the science. So what, what they were doing was having a look to see exactly how these glaciers uh, were moving and what they were formed of. Very little is known about Pylon and Glacier because it is quite remote and quite difficult to get to in the past. So they were putting up a lot of uh, these GPS units. So many of the scientists there were geophysicists or physicists, atmospheric scientists and, and glaciologists. They were looking at the physics and the science of the glacier. So this piece of kit here, bits of kit, are GPS units which they put into the glaciers and they will leave there for a couple of years. And what this is doing is these are sending back satellite signals, which can be picked up right back in the UK. And they can, will be used to work out how fast and how far the glacier is moving over a period of time. And then a lot of the scientific kit is actually attached to the tractor train so that it's continuously taking measurements as we, as we go along. In the old days, what would have happened? Something like this would have been attached to a skidoo and would rely on um, a, a, a group of people doing traverses on small skidoos uh, and intermittently stopping to do some science. Whereas this is extremely efficient because it can take uh, measurements as the tractor train is moving. So this one here, 
on the end here. There's some uh, radar kit here, and it's just looking at the, the top layers of the snow to work out how much uh, snow has been accumulating and, and, and what the type of snow is and how it's accumulating, how it's compressing. And then there are also some experiments to measure snow density. And this is done by putting, uh, drilling a hole. You can see the auger here. They're drilling a long core into the snow and they're putting equipment down to measure the density of the snow to find out uh, how compacted it's getting as you go down because that affects the property of the glacier and how it moves and how it melts. Oh, that's right. And then they, once they put it down, they have to leave it there for a few hours while they have a rest um, and uh, shelter from the, from the winds while, while this is happening. And they're also doing deeper radar. So they're setting off um, small radar pulses along a trail as you go through here from a skidoo. And this is giving a, a, re a reading of the structure of the ice going, going um, several meters down to look at what's underneath the glacier. And this is really important because you can see here, all we can see at the moment is this flat surface. And there's absolutely nothing you can tell from the surface of the glacier about what's going on underneath. So when they've compiled all these measurements, they've been able to get some early results like this. So this is the topography underneath that flat glacier, which you'd never guess from the surface. It's just completely flat at the surface. But you can see there's, there, it is quite a landscape underneath there. So there are these big channels coming down, and then there are what must be rocky areas or bumps and lumps sticking up around under the base. And this is really quite important. If it was just a big smooth bowl, you can imagine the glacier would move quite smoothly down this and probably quite fast, especially if it was lubricated at the bottom with um, water. But you can see here that there is actually quite some topography. There are areas of rocky promontories underneath the glacier where probably the glacier is going to sort of stick on and, and, and hook onto. And one of the interesting things that the scientists will be able to work out in future is whether some of the ice that's going down some of these channels is moving at a different speed than some of the areas at the edges over these lumps. And that will affect the whole nature of how the glacier moves and melts in future. So on the whole, they had a fantastically good season. They, in fact, they can't believe how good the season was. They had good weather most of the time. They had a few, few blizzards and they carried on working even in the bad times. Um, they had a few times when they have what's called a whiteout in Antarctica, when you get tiny snow crystals in the air and you really can't tell whether uh, up or down or sideways where, where you are. You're just sort of get encased in this white cotton wool and it's uh, impossible to see even where your feet are and you know, where the, the, the surface of the snow is. And at times they did have uh, blizzards and then they spent a lot of time digging out some of the equipment. And then this is one that, uh, that one of our colleagues have seen, which I think is fairly rare and it's a, a fog bow, a white rainbow. You can see here, it's the, the, the landscape is so flat that you really can see the curvature of the earth. You get this really unusual uh, atmospheric feature. So all in all, the first season was extremely successful. They traveled over 900 kilometers across this white, uh, white flat glacier, just 12 people. Uh, they took lots of different kinds of radar measurements. They never would have been able to take such long uh, distances of measurements if they had just used aircraft in the normal way that we work. And they've been able to do far, far more measurements than, than normal. And there's still equipment down there. It's buried. Uh, and, and marked so that it be ready for the next season. And so next season, there will be more people going down, uh, picking up the tractor train, which actually is being used in the winter, is taking fuel to another science site, and then we'll come back. And they will, a new set of scientists will go down and they will be drilling cores down through the ice to gain study the structure of the ice and do more measurements to see how it's flowing over time. So this is a new way of working, uh, if you like, in Antarctica, for, for the British particularly. It's extremely efficient. It allows us to do far uh, more science and newer science than we've done before. And although it looks a bit Heath rubbish and it's, you know, sort of putting a few things together, it's actually a fairly new way of working. And um, certainly for studying glaciers, it's definitely a new way of, of trying to understand 
huge areas of ice, how that they're uh, changing in climate change. So there's one more season to come. Uh, that we've got a sweepstake on in, in the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge about the weather because they've had one really good season. So, you know, the odds are the next one will be really bad. Um, but the, so the ice core uh, scientists are already packing their bags and they're all packing new equipment to go back to do the second season. And if you wait a couple more years after that, they'll have processed all the data and I'm sure they're going to come up with some spectacular new graphics and images of what's exactly under Antarctica and what's happening to this very important glacier. Thank you.